The concept of resonance starts to come up in exercise 224. So let's just take a second to, what, to talk about what resonance is and why it's important. We're able to draw single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. But some bonds are in between these. Some bonds, for example, are stronger than single bonds, but weaker than double bonds. Other bonds are stronger than double bonds, but weaker than triple bonds. So we need a way to draw intermediate bonds. And that is what resonance does. Resonance is a way to draw intermediate bonds. So how does it do that? A nice analogy is to imagine a nectarine. A nectarine is a fruit that's somewhere in between a peach and a plum. Now imagine you had to communicate to somebody what a nectarine is, but you couldn't just say nectarine. You couldn't draw a nectarine. What you could do is you could say, okay, okay, well, it's kind of like a peach. It's not a peach, though. It's also kind of like a plum. It's really what you'd get if you took the average of those two. And that at, it, the thing you're looking for is not a peach. It's not a plum. It's the average of those two a nectarine. So you can communicate something that you weren't able to draw directly by drawing things similar and telling people to take an average. And so that's what, how resonance draws those in-between bonds. Now, there are a couple symbols that repeat over and over. The first thing is that you have brackets around here, and the brackets warn you, watch out, the structure the thing I'm talking about is not a peach, and it's not a plum. It's the average of those two. And the second thing you'll see is a special arrow called a resonance arrow. It has just one line and two heads, so the head pointing in both directions. Do not confuse that with an equilibrium arrow that you saw in general chemistry. An, an equilibrium arrow, so it's not this. An equilibrium arrow tells you that the reactants are turning into products and products are turning back into reactants at the same time. They're flipping back and forth. That is not what this arrow here is telling you. This arrow here is telling you neither of these structures is correct. To see, get the true thing, you have to average them. This arrow is telling you take the average. Okay, so resonance is a way of drawing non-integer bonds, and it does that by drawing the most similar bonds and telling you, take the average. And there's a warning that you have to do that in these brackets that people draw. Now, each of these things that are not the true thing are called resonance structures. Oops. Structures. And the true thing that you really wanted to communicate, that's called a resonance hybrid. So the true, we're going to do this not with peaches and plums to visualize nectarines. We're going to do this with two different versions of a molecule. Each version of a molecule is a resonance structure. Individually, it's not the real thing. The real molecule never looks like either of these things, just like a nectarine never looks like a peach and never just looks like a plum. The real molecule is going to be the average of the two, the resonance hybrid. Okay, so resonance is a way of drawing in-between bonds, and as we'll see, the meaning of resonance, the significance of it, is that the more resonance you have, the more stable a molecule will become, and the more rigid it will become. And that's significant because if a molecule is stable and rigid, it is a prime candidate to be a, a messenger molecule, to be a biological messenger. If it's stable, then it's not going to change much as it travels from one place to another. And if it's rigid, it's going to reliably fit into a receptor site. Okay. So let's use curved arrows to see how you can change one of these resonance structures into another. The question says, in each case below, draw the curved arrows required, those are in red, 
in order to convert the first resonance structure into the second resonance structure. In each case, begin by drawing all the lone pairs and, the formal, and then use the formal charges to guide you. Okay, so first let's draw those lone pairs. Now you know every atom needs eight electrons around it. So we really have to worry about the oxygens and uh, the nitrogens if we have them. So this oxygen on the left has one, two bonds. Each bond has two electrons. So that oxygen has two, four electrons around it. So we'll need six, eight, two lone pairs. O the oxygen on the right has just two electrons around it in that one bond. So we'll need four, six, eight, three lone pairs. Carbon only has a lone pair if it has a negative charge. And in the structure, it has a positive charge. If carbon has no charge, it doesn't have a lone pair. So this is what we've got. Now we want to look for places where electrons have moved. So notice here in this bond, that was a double bond, and now it's a single bond as it goes from the left to the right. That means the electrons moved away from there. To show electrons moving away, you put the tail of a curved arrow. If you look at the oxygen, it started with two lone pairs, and it ends with three lone pairs. So electrons must have moved on to the oxygen. So the curved arrow points at the oxygen. So for example, this, the electrons in this bond get moved and become a new lone pair. That's if you go from the molecule on the left to the molecule on the right. Okay, let's try B. So here, first step, draw all the lone pairs. The oxygen on the left, this oxygen, already has two, four electrons. Remember, two electrons in each bond. So we need six, eight, two lone pairs there. The oxygen on the right already has two electrons, so we need four, six, eight. So that has three lone pairs. Uh, the only other elements in these compounds are the hydrogen, the carbons that we need to worry about, and the carbon would only have a lone pair if it had a negative charge. Okay, so let's look for bonds that where the number of electrons change, either lone pairs or bonds uh, that change. So you'll notice in this bond right here that starts as a double bond and it ends as a single bond. That means electrons in that bond must have moved away from it. So we'll have the tail of an arrow pointing away from that bond. And then if you notice on the oxygen there are two lone pairs on the left, six lone pairs on the right, so electrons must have gone on to the oxygen. So we can have this curved arrow pointing at the oxygen. So if you were to follow those electrons, it would be like the electrons in this bond becoming that new lone pair. Other bonds change too. Notice this bond right here is a double bond in the, in the structure on the left and a single bond in the structure on the right. And that means that we'll have a tail, the tail of an arrow, pointing away from that because those electrons are moving away from there. Right next to it, at the top right, we have a bond that starts as a single bond, ends as a double bond, so electrons must have traveled there. So we'll have the head of an arrow pointing at that. So if you wanted to track it, you could say that these electrons right here ended up becoming these electrons right there. That's what the curved arrow is trying to communicate. Let's try C. So first step, draw all the lone pairs. Now each of these oxygens and nitrogens needs eight electrons around it. This oxygen has two, four electrons already, so we need six, eight, two lone pairs there. The nitrogen has two, four electrons, so we need six, eight, two lone pairs here. The oxygen on the other structure has just two electrons around it, so four, six, eight. The nitrogen on the other structure has two, four, six electrons around it, so we'll just add one lone pair to get eight. All right, now that we have those lone pairs, let's look for places where bonds change. 
Notice, on the left here, we have a bond that starts as a double bond and ends as a single bond. That means electrons are traveling away from there. So we'll put the tail of an arrow there. And if you notice, at the oxygen, it starts with two lone pairs and you end with three. That means electrons had to travel onto that oxygen. So we'll have the head of an arrow pointing there. So if you wanted to track it, you could say that the electrons in this pi bond became this new lone pair. We can look at another bond here. This is a single bond on the left and a double bond on the right. So electrons must have traveled to that bond. So we'll have the head of an arrow pointing there. And if you notice on the nitrogen, the nitrogen starts with two lone pairs and ends with just one. So electrons must have left the nitrogen. So we'll have the tail of the arrow pointing there. So if we wanted to track those electrons, you could see that they're blue there, and they end up forming that second pi bond here. All right, last but not least, we have D here. Um, so the first step would be to draw any lone pairs. We only have carbon and hydrogen in this molecule, and the carbon would only have a negative, it would only have a lone pair if it had a negative charge. So none of these carbons have a negative charge, so we don't have to worry about any lone pairs. So we can jump straight to the curved arrows. So let's look for places where the bonds are different. Notice here on the left, that's a double bond. This, the same place on the structure on the right is a single bond. So electrons must have been traveling away from there. So we'll have a tail pointing away from that in the molecule. And then if you notice, this bond right there is a single bond on the left and a double bond on the right. That means electrons must have traveled toward that. So we'll have the head of the arrow pointing at that bond, because it's where the electrons are going. So if you wanted to track that, you'd have these electrons there become oops, those electrons on the right. OK. Let's just take stock for a second of what these structures mean. What are they even trying to tell you? The, the brackets are like flashing lights. Watch out. Neither structure inside here is the true structure. The true structure is the average of the two. The arrow is telling you, take the average of these molecules. The true structure is not either one. It's the, the hybrid of the two. So, in the true structure, this bond between this carbon and oxygen is not a double bond. It's also not a single bond. It's something in between, a 1.5 bond. This oxygen doesn't have a zero charge in the true structure, and it also doesn't have a full negative one charge in the true structure. It has the average. It has around a negative 0 0.5 charge. So to get the true structure, you'd average these two. So just for the sake of comparison, if we go back to this structure here, the brackets flashing lights telling you, watch out. Neither of these structures is the true structure. Just like a nectarine is not a peach and it's not plum. It's the average of the two. The true structure is the average of these two structures. The arrow is telling you, take the average, take the average. It's not telling you that this molecule turns into this and turns back. It's telling you, take the average. In the true structure, this is not a double bond or a single bond. It's something in between, a 1.5 bond, for example. Same with this bond here. In the true structure, it's not a single bond, and it's not a double bond. It's the average of those two, so like a 1.5 bond. And notice something else that's, that's very significant that will tell you that is important for understanding how these mole um, this molecule would react. In the true molecule, there's not a full charge there or a zero charge. It's something in between. There's a partial positive charge there. And in the true molecule, there's not a zero charge here 
for a full positive charge, there's a partial positive charge here. So if you were just going to take a stab at drawing the what the true molecule would look like, it would look something like oops, something like this. That's what it would look like, where you have those 1.5 bonds, and each of these carbons has a slight positive charge. So that's what this, these, this whole resonance setup is trying to communicate to you. And notice how significant this is going to be to explain how this mo molecule would react. If you had a negatively charged atom, or a neg negatively charged uh, molecule, like hydroxide, where will that be attracted? If you just had this structure, hopefully it would make sense that it would be attracted to that positive carbon. The opposite charges attract. If you only had this structure, though, it would make no sense that the oxygen is also attracted to that carbon. You need the resonance structure to show you that there's also a partial positive charge there, and that means that something that's negatively charged will be attracted to that carbon, too. So these resonance structures let you visualize charges in places you might not immediately see them. And those charges will be responsible for different reactions. So that's what resonance is. It's a way of drawing, way of drawing intermediate bonds, non-integer bonds, bonds that are in between single doubles and triples. And the significance of it is that when you have this resonance, it makes molecules more stable and more rigid.